My guest today is actress-director Karen Bryson. Now, her multi-award-winning career spans over 25 years across various multimedia platforms, both in front of the camera and more recently behind it. Now, Karen was awarded an MBE in 2017 for her services to drama, but she is also best known for playing Avril Powell in the critically acclaimed drama Shameless. And her recent acting projects include series regular and award-winning Nordic drama, White Wall, Black Narcissus on BBC and FXUS, and also portrayed Eleanor Stone in Zack Snyder's Justice League on HBO Max. Now, her newest short film, Monochromatic, is her directorial debut, and Monochromatic is a very powerful film in which we are taken on a journey to walk in the shoes of a little girl and her mother during the late 1970s, watching innocence fade as racism takes its toll. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome actress, director, Karen Bryson, and her short film, Monochromatic, to the show. Welcome, Karen. Thank you for having me. Hi. <laughs> well, it is great to have you, and wow, what an incredible film you created. You wrote, you directed, the film Monochromatic, what inspired you to make this film? Life, um, the sad circumstances of um, discrimination, um, lost innocence. I just wanted to write something that started a conversation um, about racism um, or anti-blackness or anti-blackness or brownness. Um, and so far it's had quite a positive res response in terms of it starting the conversation. Um, lots of conversations have been had as a result of, of screening this. Well, I noticed at the very beginning of the film, the words Wood Green London. Tell me about the significance of Wood Green London, uh, according to your film. Okay, so Wood Green London is a, um, a little borough, a, a little town in London, um, and the significance of it being in Wood Green London in 1977 is that formed the, the real backdrop of the battle for Wood Green as it's known now. Um, there was um, the penultimate National Front March and the National Front were a party, a far right party that was starting to get a political stronghold in very diverse London, but it was working. And they started a march or protest and it was met with 2000 strong anti-protesters i mean there's a whole story um around the backdrop but predominantly the the film is about lost innocence the moment a little black girl realizes that the world operates on bias sadly when it comes to the color of her skin yeah now your film like you just said your film was created looking through the eyes of a child who sees the world for its simplicity, its beauty, and even its innocence. Why did you choose a child to tell this story? Because I, th I, one of the things that have come out, I mean, this is kind of choice time that we're actually having this um, interview and this talk. Well, thank you so much. But what's happening in the UK is quite frightening. Now, one of the things that is going to be very interesting to know is during this period of time, how many conversations are black or brown parents having to have at this point? Children are born without any, they're born innocent um, until life happens, socialization happens. Um, racism isn't something you're born with, it's something you're taught. So I'm interested in that period of time from when innocence fades and the harsh realities of the world take over and what that looks like, ish. And I say ish, because it's that moment where we kind of fill the gaps in, but it's her journey towards that moment of realization. You know, Wood Green London, like you said, 1977, then there were these much larger riots around 1981. Right now, is, is this history repeating itself uh, within the UK uh, right now? I mean, like what, 40, 45 years later? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing that I wanted to highlight in the film, that one could argue, and it sounds really pessimistic, it's not, we've moved on in many respects, but one could argue 
same stuff, different decade. Now, there is a moment in the film where there's a bit of real footage of that penultimate National Front March. And most people who know politics of this country will know the name Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn at one point was um, up for prime minister um, against Boris Johnson, which in itself is a whole little story. Um, he was the councillor for Haringey at the time. He knew the march was going to happen. He went to the police and he said, will you stop the march? And the police said, no, they've got a right to march. So Jeremy Corbyn said, right. So what he'd done is he'd gotten the burgeoning anti-Nazi league at the time, there were a few of them. The guys who started the movement Rock Against Racism, which was a global concerts all over the world, spreading awareness about this very issue. Um, TUC members, um, and also, or most importantly, locals. It's a very diverse area. 2,000 strong anti-protesters turned up with rotten fruit, eggs, flour, and saw them off. So very similar to what we're seeing now. So some of the, the, um, the pictures and videos coming out of all of yesterday, there were planned protests or riots, or whatever you want to say, there were planned protests by the far right, far right all over the UK. And what was heartening is anti-protesters. UK said no. So the pictures coming out, you are seeing tens of thousands of, um, of people saying no, no to hate, no. And very similar to what was um, happening in uh, 1977 on St. George's Day with those 2000 strong wood green inhabitants coming out to say no. And it actually worked. They stopped the march. I think it was only probably about 500, 600 meters into the marching. And that was all down to organization, passion, and a need to say, no, stop. I mean, are you so surprised I that here you've created this film and then all of this is happening in the UK? Are you shocked on the timing? <laughs> the timing is quite extraordinary, but it's what I'm finding in history. If we look at history, it, it almost repeats itself. So one of the things that I suppose I was most moved by is when people are underestimating the far right. We now have the internet, which of course allows those cells to communicate quite freely, always bubbling under the surface. We have to really, really take a look at this. Otherwise it will repeat itself again. There's a moment in the film where that is kind of the question that I want to ask the audience. If we don't deal with this, it will keep happening. And it, and it will. And within your film, I, I noticed that there were many moments of innocence. Uh, and, and, when I, and with innocence, you know, people will say things. Um, and with children, you know, they will say things. They have no idea if they're saying anything right or wrong. They're just being children. I mean, and yeah. there's that, that scene with the little white girl not understanding someone with a different skin color and thinking that her skin color will change to white when she gets older as she's talking to the other little girl. That's just, that's just, and it's that's yes. just being children. But, but what that, it actually is, yeah, I've subverted ahead. it. So I've actually had Grace ask her, are you brown underneath? That's it's right. It's just purely innocent. If you start to notice, if you're starting to notice skin color, well, why am I this shade? and you're that shade. And that's what I kind of wanted to do, play around with, that usually the narrative that we hear is a white child would rub a black child's hand and say, does it rub off? I've heard that many times and I've actually seen it in films. So I've subverted that to highlight the innocence of it all, that it's not a thing, they're just going, oh. Yeah, and, and, that and that's what I moment. loved. Yeah, I love the innocence of that whole exchange. And mm. even with the lead character, the little girl, even when she's walking down the sidewalk and she's reading graffiti and making up a song. I mean, yeah. we all did that when we were a kid. And even when we don't understand some of the things that we read or, or sing a song that were maybe in fact wrong, but you even highlighted that because 
you really push the point that racism is taught. Yeah, of course. Because nobody's born yeah. racist. No. And I suppose the whole vehicle of the way it's shot was to allow an audience to really take the journey with grace. So having, knowing that it's POV, so you say, oh, who am I as the person behind the camera? Because the camera is doing that. Who am I? Which is why I have the shot. I thought we have to see Grace fairly early on so that, so that we know as an audience, oh, we're Grace. So it's actually going one step further and we become Grace. We are in the shoes of Grace, which is why there are some moments which feel quite uh, experiential or, or visceral. Uh, the spinning, the Wonder Woman, which makes you on a big screen can feel slightly dizzy. I want to take that audience, lead them by the hand and say, OK, so you want to know what this is like? Let's be Grace. Yeah. And the spinning so when round. You see her, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, because we've seen her quite early on when she's reading. The graffiti, you know, it's a black child that's going to have an impact. You're just, and that's what I've tried to do throughout just by introducing grace fairly, fairly early on our minds as an audience do the filling in of the gaps. So yeah. that's the bit where I think people go, Oh yeah. And, and not only that, the graffiti was a national front. Yeah. And she has no idea because because the way it was written, it was an N and a, an F quite close up. So she actually says, N -f -f. <laughs> she's no idea how to pronounce it. Yeah. And yeah, that th that's the innocence. Yeah. yeah, that's the innocence. And, you know, even with, um, you know, with her spinning around, it was, it was a child being a child, uh, soaking in, the surrounding of the countryside of where she was. Uh, we've all, I mean, how many of us have as a kid went on a merry-go-round and pushed it as fast as we could. And then when we finally got off, we were wobbling around because we were dizzy, but it was yes, fun. Cool. And that, and, and you highlighted that I was even amazed on because this is, I mean, can you believe that we're actually thinking, that the 1970s is now a period piece, but it yeah. is. How were you able to get the look of really of what we would see in the 1970s? I grew up in the 70s, so it looked authentic. Thank you. I did a lot of research. So one of the mechanisms I used, because we didn't have a huge budget, I had to be very careful about what could be seen. So I used lots of mechanisms to help an audience. Firstly, being the aspect ratio. So 4.3 is standard 1970s TV. So already you've got that. And when you've got that aspect ratio, it also allows us as filmmakers to cut out cars. Um, it allows us as an audience to be closer to the subject because of the aspect ratio. So there were things like that. Um, also, there was always a feel of when you think about memories, because that's another layer on top, our memories were always sparkly. If you think about photos in the 70s, that faded feel, we always, regardless of what the memories were, we always looked at them fondly. So I relied at one point on the weather and the weather, the great British weather let me down. So I had some moments with shadow play and myself and Tristan Chenet, the extraordinary um, director of photography, we'd worked out what we would need sunwise to get the shot with the shadow play and her walking along the riverbank with a shadow, her friend. We'd worked it out. I was really pleased with myself. We both were. And then the first AD sort of said, well, when you guys are looking to shoot, there is absolutely no sun. So it's plan B and then plan C and plan C ended up being one of my favorite shots. And that's the shot where she's tying the blade of grass, the simplicity of a really still moment and the joy from a simple action like tying 
a blade of grass without a worry in the world. And when you hear it in a cinema, the sound design was so poignant, you can hear her exhale. So she ties it and you just hear, which I think is really beautiful. Just it, simple. Yeah, simple it is. Line. It's those little things that, like I said, that's the biggest thing that I noticed about this film was the innocence. Mm. And to see innocence lost is heartbreaking. In this film, what was the significance of the neo-Nazi bringing the little girl home after she fell down and cut her hand? He didn't say or show any action of being racist towards the little girl, even though his t-shirt showed his strong racist views. Uh, why did you show that? Right. So firstly, I mean, this can go two, three ways. Some audience members have come up with different ideas around what that looked like. My idea of it was that this is a kid who's wearing a Nazi T-shirt. We know what that is. We know in our mind what that, how powerful a symbol that is and what that stands for and how disgusting a symbol of it is. For this kid, is it just a T-shirt? Is it his big brother's? Is his big brother... Um, a neo-Nazi. Um, he couldn't have been what his t-shirt said, otherwise he would have stepped over her or kicked her in. And my point is, it goes back to this same idea of we are not born with it. So regardless of his views, the laces actually say he's not neo-Nazi because there's, there's detail in the laces. There's a whole code in the DMs, the Dr. Martins, the lace color says something. Um, but the reason I wanted to put this young skinhead, as they were known then, in a, a Nazi T-shirt is I actually saw quite a famous pop star. I'm not saying who it is, who we know, definitely know not to be racist. And yet I've seen photographs with that particular musician, big, big musician in the 70s with a Nazi t-shirt on like it was fashion. So I don't know what that's about, but it's that thing of, we know what that stands for. There's a responsibility around that, what that looks like, because the whole thing about the, the whole skinhead thing and the laces, there was a whole movement in the seventies called Scar. Now, most young people of a particular ilk, as in punks, skinheads, certain skinheads, obviously, and rusters. There was a whole movement called Scar, which was a mix of all of that. And the idea behind that was the young rebels, the outcasts of society. And they actually joined together and started a whole movement of music that we all know. There's some songs and they're Scar songs, things like, a letter to you, Rudy. That's all. So it's got reggae beat, but a slight sort of edgy, punky feel. That's the movement. And yet, if you were to look at some of those guys, they look scary. They look like skinheads with the same, the drain pipes, the Harringtons, the look. But it's the laces. The code was the laces. But for Grace's mother, she's not going to know those differences. She's just a woman, married, wants to bring her children up. Um, invited over to this country to rebuild a post-war Britain and just wanted to get her head down. She's not going to know the nuances. She sees a t-shirt, sees a skinhead. Get off my doorstep. What have you done to my daughter? Is her first, you know, response. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that I didn't even think about because, like you said, back in the day, we don't see it too much today, though, but, you know, People would grab things for fashion and not either they're ignorant to the fact of what is on their T-shirt. Uh, but like you said, it was the it was the laces of his Doc Martens that would probably be more likely a telltale sign as to what his true beliefs really were. So is he just doing fashion or was he actually believing it? Exactly. But the point is, most people aren't going to know that. That's right. And that's what I find really interesting. Most every, most everyday people are not going to know what those signals are. When I talk about those laces, 
after screenings at festivals, which people find absolutely fascinating, they all have no clue. And they could have actually have grown up during that period of time. No clue. It was on research. And I went, ah, ah, of course there's a code. Well, in a way, well, you did actually in this film, because with that young man, there is in a way there's a reverse judgment there, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And so yes. you actually brought, you actually brought judgment to both sides of the street here, which I the way that you did it was brilliant because you did it with such artistry. It's fear. I want to, I'd rather use the word fear and I'll tell you why, because I think fear forms part of the basis of racism as well as fear. Bev is scared. She opens the door. She sees her daughter with some man who's dressed in the way he has and he's got a Nazi t-shirt and there's blood on her hands. Fear. The other, you know, what we see of blatant racism in the piece is born of fear. What else could it be? It's not rational. Yeah. All but, born of fear. Yeah, you're right. It's completely born of fear. And that mm. fear actually bleeds over into one of the most powerful scenes in this film, and that's the church scenes because they're so powerful. It broke my heart to watch the that scene in this film. I mean, a place where we're to find peace and comfort as we're all, you know, the same in the Lord's eyes, but attending church does not wash away the sins of racism. No, no, or fear or what that looks like. And she's a child. And that's it. That is the most purest form of rabble rousing, which is what's happening now and, and fear. Um, and I started the film, I just want to, to almost um, bookend. I yeah. started the film with a speech, an Enoch Powell speech, um, which was in 1968. And he was a conservative member of parliament at the time. And this speech really famous among a certain age group, youngsters would have to Google it, but it was rousing it split the nation in 1968 he was soon fired um, or whether he fired he was fired or whether he resigned but it was really explosive and it did a lot of damage a lot of damage um it incites racial hatred there's a word in it which is one of the most offensive words you can think of and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna use it here. It's pickney, or pickaninny. Um, this is what I mean about mirroring. So Enoch Powell used the word pickaninny. Boris Johnson, less than ten years ago, our prime minister, used the word. He then recalled by saying he was joking, which is why I needed that word in this piece. So the guy who played Len was amazing. Um, well, it's you, really important. And it, again, it mirrors that same thing. That is a really offensive term. We're talking about mirrors in history and that word. And Boris Johnson, our, our prime minister at the time. And this is in, I mean, he's just, this is recently. In the last five years, he's used the word pickaninny. Yeah, that is... That is unbelievable. Now, you said yeah. 1968. So yes. I have a question. I know what the history is of 1968 in America. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. The whole country was just literally, it, it, it's just on fire. Yeah. Was this were similar things like that going on at the in the UK at the same time? Right. So this is the thing that's really bizarre about this whole period of time. Um, 1968 and partly a wee bit before that, uh, 10, 15 years before that, Commonwealth countries 
were called upon and given citizenship from parts of Africa, the West Indies, as it was known then, so the Caribbean, and Asia, parts of Asia, so Pakistan, India, a whole influx came over, which is why we hear the terminology Windrush. There was a boat that brought um, um, immigrants over from, they were invited over. Now they took certain positions to rebuild a post-war Britain. So without that help, we wouldn't be where we are today. So the NHS has its back on, you know, has its feet on the backs of the immigrants who were asked to come over to help rebuild it. So what then happened after that speech, you'd hear people saying, they're taking our jobs. So after 20 years, apparently it wasn't great, but people were getting used to um, black and brown people being in this country at, at, at such a rate. But then it got to that speech where Enoch Powell pretty much called on racial, racial hatred and caused this divide, which is why I used that section at the top of the film. Um, and did it as if to say, this is the world that Grace is born into, which is why you've got the shots of the sky. Um, yeah, so that apparent, and I've done some research with some um, really fantastic guys who were around at the time, like Don Letts has done a fantastic documentary about, about the music scene during that time. And at the time he was a youngster, a young black guy. And he said, I don't know how true this is, but his experience was, there was no trouble before that speech. He said he didn't feel the hostility before that speech, which really roused people up, up and down the UK. And that was the start of the National Front. Prior to that, it could have been the Black Shirts or another movement. And that's what we've also found in history, that once the National Front um, died down, another would take its place. What have we got now? The EDL. So there's always going to be a movement that gets its way, that gets its way through. Um, yeah, I've forgotten the question. I've rambled. No, 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 I'm no, because no, no, it, no, it was the history because I was wondering because I know what the United States went through in 1968. Yeah. And then you'd mentioned 68 for the UK. And it is sometimes I just wish that uh, government officials would just keep their mouth shut. Yeah, I know. Because a lot of times they, they, yeah, they... They yes. stir the pot, yeah. Either on purpose, or if they even try to do something good, there's always another opposition that's going to twist it around. It's a never-ending battle. But I want to get back to that church scene. I'm not going to give away the most powerful part of this film because I want everybody to see it. But there's that scene when the little girl turns to the, the white lady and says peace be with you with love in her heart and quickly is rebuked by the woman with a racist attitude that was the most heartbreaking part of that scene yeah really interesting and it's so interesting ward i'm glad you've said that that you said racist attitude and that's for a reason so she all she says is no so one could argue well she just said no but we know what that looks like I've taken an audience thus far, an audience goes, oh my gosh, no matter where you're from, the color of the skin, your religion, that moment speaks volumes. She just says no, but we know. And that's the point. Yeah. That there are mountains, there are, there, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm, there are times when I'm sure some black and brown people might have felt gaslit when kind of marking or seeing something might have felt gaslit because it's something you can just tell. And I'm glad you said that. And I didn't, I didn't point you in that direction. No. You just saw the attitude. You saw the attitude and you saw her eyes. And it That's was very, and it was very ugly. Yes. And here she is trying, trying to think she's as holy and righteous as the next person and her true color came out yes yes and yeah. and that's what made that part so heartbreaking but i want everybody to see this film but that ending shot of the little girl all grown up 
I actually had to go back to study the transition because I was like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And because it showed the years of racism that she endured, cover the countenance on her face, very powerful. Uh, you couldn't have ended that film any better. Mm. Thank you. Because there's also where we started this conversation, a moment where you hear the woman's daughter outside of the church. And you know what the point is there, that if we don't deal with this head on and have these very difficult conversations or moments like we're seeing in the UK now, um, where people are coming together and actually visually saying no. Um, we'll keep doing the same thing. So this week has been exhausting and harrowing. Um, but I feel some hope. I've seen a lot of stuff on social media with people filming where, um, you know, some elderly, I saw a, a, um, a video of an, an elderly white woman who just wanted to say, please don't think I'm racist because I'm not. I'm sorry this is happening to you. Are you okay? You know, I, I know. saw I saw a, um, I'm trying to remember if it was a news item or it was a news reporting, but I think it was on like Instagram and, and reported and showed a picture of a, of a 76 year old white man who walked with his cane to a mosque to stand there and say, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to protect my people yes. in my country. Yes. Meaning he was, he yes. was, he was supporting and protecting the mosque. I saw it. Yeah. And I thought really powerful, very powerful. And he had, um, he had a walking stick. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'm like, okay, see, I see there are going to be people who are going to be scanning and they're just going to go right by it, not think twice about it, stick to their beliefs instead of stopping reading and going, oh, because he has the attitude that we're all supposed to have. Yeah. Yeah. But for you, what have the audience's reaction been to your film? It's been incredible. It's been really incredible. So there, I, um, I'm really, uh, uh, the audiences are really different. So I just did um, a festival, a load of screenings of the festival with a lot of young filmmakers. So they weren't even a thought in their parents' eyes at this point, not even a thought in their parents' head. So these are really, you know, under thirties who didn't necessarily know some of the history and asked um, really, really powerful moments with this film. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was quite I, emotional. Well, yeah, I, what I'm thinking is weeks. no. Go ahead, Karen. It's starting to be, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. It's starting to speak to people. It's starting to um, be the springboard of much needed conversation, open, honest conversation about you know what's going on and yeah. what went on and how we need to yeah do better. I'm I'm thinking that the BBC. ITV, Sky News needs to contact you and sit down face to face and talk about what is actually going on right now in conjunction with your film, because the timing couldn't have been more perfect. I know. I know. And it's really, it's kind of sad because weirdly last year when we started the festival, um, we did one one in Britain before it went to America. And in America, there was fresh eyes, which was quite an interesting dynamic anyway. But some of the people in the first festival we did in London were like, oh, so yeah, a story of yesteryear. Yeah. Youngsters not realizing. Yeah. So, oh God, things have changed. No, they haven't. But it's really great that you think that. I just don't want you to be left footed. Yeah. You know, if we've got Google now and what's what's really interesting, if there's anything you don't understand, we've now got the knowledge, the touch of, you know, the end of our fingertips, which is so hugely important moving forward. Um, 
there are so many and if even if you don't want to google there are so many other films that that's a social commentary of the time which are are going to be invaluable tools for the future entertaining they may make you laugh but they are set in certain periods of time that just allow us to have an illustration of life life yeah. in various periods yeah, of time I, yeah i, I like. recently <clears throat> i recently had an interview uh with someone that wrote a novel and the novel depicted racism in the 1930s up to about 19 i guess 44 and everything that i read in that book and what and of course it's just a novel but it was based on true type events i was shocked from what i read and what i see today nothing has changed and we're talking what not um, 85 90 years and nothing has yeah. changed in the areas of racism. Damn. I was, I it's, was stunned. It's kind of scary. Yeah. Um, because it, I do think things have changed. Yeah. Ish. Our attitude has changed a little bit. Our willingness to look and learn. I think um, the thing that's changed that, that's a little worrying is the rabble rousing via the internet. The fact that now people can be reached, vulnerable people who don't necessarily understand what it is they're, they're, they're frightened of. Um, yeah, it's the rabble rousing. And, you know, I think throughout history, we have seen great orators move nations very powerful tool that if you can give a good speech as to why you should hate a certain section of the population and that is rousing enough and that fills your heart and then suddenly you because that's what's coming out now the rhetoric that's coming out now is it's patriotism oh okay that's what you're calling it but it's the rabble rousing it's the but you we've seen it throughout history and we've seen it to huge detriment of human life you know where yeah i think the i think populations of people follow someone's words yeah i think the i think i think gaslighting has become the new weapon People don't know the difference between misinformation, disinformation, because the lines are extremely blurred and there's technically not an authority in the news media whatsoever that you could even barely believe because yes. you can take and speak 75% truth, cover it with 25% exactly. of a lie and people don't know which is which. And that's where we are today. And unfortunately, those in power are using it from what they think is their advantage, but they're just causing more and more problems. And again, it comes down to each and every single one of us to treat each other with respect and kindness, mm -hmm. regardless what we look like, and not to judge a book by cover and definitely stop going back in hit. I mean, yeah, I believe that we need to look back in history, but we need to be careful when we go back in history and not say, Oh yeah, that guy was right. No. The only thing that's right is we yeah. treat each other with respect and kindness regardless. You're right. But I don't, and that's, I, I don't think the, the past should ever, ever be ignored because no. we can get complacent. I think we can get comfortable and that's the kind of point of monochromatic that 45 years ago is almost mirroring what's happening now so the graffiti on the walls which were really offensive now we've got twitter or x where we can sprout hate a platform there but it was on every wall in london practically every spare wall had some kind of disgusting racial abuse on it 
so the minute we start forgetting what those years look like is the minute we get off guard and before you know it that's right this week happening that's it ladies and gentlemen Karen Bryson's cinematic short film, Monochromatic, is about the inescapable moment. A six-year-old girl realizes the world operates with bias when it comes to the color of her skin. But we're all born equal. Then life happens. Karen Bryson is a visionary filmmaker. Brilliant actress. But bringing truth in her film, Monochromatic, that I pray opens your eyes and opens your heart to change. Karen, you have blessed me today, and I want to thank you so much for coming onto the show to talk about this very powerful film. And again, the timing is uncanny. I know. Scaringly so, but yes, you're right. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure to talk about this. It's important. Thank uh, you. Very, very important. And ladies and gentlemen, when you get the opportunity to see Monochromatic, you're going to see a film that well, that should be resonating with us for many decades to come. And the next time you go out to the store or maybe you go to the movies or whatever, remember, we're all created equal. Treat each other with respect and kindness and stop judging a book by its cover. And I can tell you what you ought to be doing is you ought to create conversations to listen and understand what other people may go through or what their life or their backstory actually is. And then you'll be able to understand even more what we need, as the Lord says, to love one another. So ladies and gentlemen, I want you can catch all of the replays of our interviews with the top film directors and the producers, screenwriters and actors and more on Bond on Cinema. We're also available on YouTube as well as a dozen audio platforms as well. So subscribe when you find Bond on Cinema. And I want to thank you for watching and listening. And as for me, I'll either see you at the movies or from the red carpet.